Thank you for the introduction, John, and for setting the scene so, uh, so eloquently. And uh, thank you to the Global Seminar for the invitation to speak here today. Um, the new media, how can it save lives and how might it harm them? Uh, let me just pick up where I left off with the Salzburg Global Seminar, which was at the board meeting in London in March when uh, um, Usha Prussia and Vijay invited me to speak at your closing dinner uh, on a Friday evening in March. And I just returned from a, uh, uh, a lecture in Switzerland because it was World TB Day actually on, on that day. Um, and just to mention uh, a few words about uh, tuberculosis, it, it, it causes a million and a half deaths a year, arising from nine million new cases every year, which in turn arise from a latently infected reservoir of one third of the world's population. That's two billion infected people. And there are two tragedies about this. One is that this, the TB treatment is one of the most cost-effective healthcare interventions that we have. So this is an abject failure of putting what we know works well into practice. Secondly, our tools for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention are ancient, which is a fail of the failure of the biomedical research community to deliver what's required. This is our TB toolkit, which is actually not fit for purpose. It's these tools we've been using to fight the world's largest infectious disease pandemic. And you can see how old they are. I won't labor the point. What I will say is that the last decade of renewed investment and interest in TB research, not least uh, through my own uh, laboratory, has resulted in new diagnostics, uh, which are now being deployed and in use since a, since a few years, uh, new vaccines that are in the pipeline, and new treatments that are also just coming out. So that's good news. The reason for showing you this background on TB is really to introduce this slide, which is the area of research I've been concerned with over the last uh, 15 years. It's what's called translational research, and it's a pathway that takes you from basic science and discovery through development and evaluation of new tools that you create through their validation and application to result in public health and societal impact. So that's concerned me for the last 15 to 20 years. But what I've learned is that actually this translational research pathway is actually only the beginning, because what one needs to do is to engage with policymakers early on to ensure that pricing, access, and regulation can all really result in public health and societal impact, because you can make the tools, you can validate them, you can create the evidence base, but actually this step to have public health and societal impact, you need to pay great attention to these key issues, pricing, access, regulation. And that was where I left my uh, speech at the, at the Salzburg Global Seminar board meeting in London in March, which was these three issues, which I see as three big barriers, which I think the Global Seminar would be the right sort of uh, organization to consider these three big barriers as we, as we deliver on medical scientific innovation, create the tools, actually making the change requires us to address these three barriers, which are generally neglected, unfortunately. So the first is equitable and affordable access to new tools in poor parts of the, the world by poor people. Regulated deployment of new tools so that they don't become blunted, and a good example would be the new antibiotics we've just developed for TB, which if they're used indiscriminately, as they will be in India and Africa because of lack of regulation, then the bacteria will soon become resistant to them, and those new silver bullets will pretty soon be blunted. And the third is tackling underlying socioeconomic barriers to improved health. So I think these are three things which, unless they're addressed, doesn't matter how many billions we pour into scientific research and how much we innovate, we won't make the impact that we should make until we address those. So that was, if you like, going a bit beyond the paradigm to discuss those points with the seminar and to ask the seminar to think about these issues and to consider what might be done, this conference has taken me even further beyond the paradigm and truly out of the box and out of my comfort zone because I'm someone who knows very little about social media. I've never tweeted in my life and I've got a sort of paranoia about Facebook because I'm a sort of Feel a, feel, I'm a sort of generally private person and I feel if I even go there, everything about my life will be known by everyone on the web. Um, so uh, it's led me to think truly outside of the box, which has been a pleasure. 
And um, uh, I think what I'm going to tell you is that it's about striking the balance, that new media offers huge potential for improving, improving global health, so wising up, but it also carries a huge risk of exacerbating growing health problems in society today. And the net balance will depend on how we deploy the new media for maximum health benefit, and equally importantly, how we limit or regulate its potential for harm. And the rest of this talk is going to be really just some ideas that I've tried to marshal together, because um, I don't know if you know, but uh, Voltaire to summarized the role of the doctor in the, in the 19th century, uh, sorry, no, in, yes, in the 19th century, as to, to, sorry, the 18th century, to, to entertain the patient whilst nature takes its course. <laughs> and, and, and I see the role of the... Uh, ho hopefully, uh, we're doing a little better than, than that today, but I see the, 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 the task of the speaker to the Salzburg Global Seminar to, as, as entertaining the audience whilst they formulate their own insights. So these are just a few pointers and ideas. And I think new media will impact in four key areas. And I think two of them are relatively almost straightforwardly good enabling steps in terms of the technology it offers. And that is using, for example, mobile telephony to improve patient compliance and adherence and transfer knowledge to patients. And that is something which uh, Bright Simon is going to talk about. Also telemedicine and remote monitoring. Those are quite straightforward, positive, enabling impacts. The more interesting ones, I think, and the more complex ones are up here. And I think the most important, I'm going to talk about these two for the rest of the, 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 this talk. And the, the first of them is patient self-education, which is really the motor of change, I think, in healthcare today. And it's enabled uh, by new media. So patient self-education, really, uh, knowledge is power and patient self-education basically empowers patients. So patients become empowered, they learn about self-care and their empowerment and their knowledge, as um, uh, John uh, gave a nice example from his own uh, condition and his meeting with his general practitioner, patient empowerment and self-care leads to a, leading, uh, to a changing role of the physician. It greatly impacts on the doctor-patient relationship. So too does patient misinformation. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of misinformation. And you can also uh, take correct information, but take it on in the wrong way. So physicians need to uh, uh, deal with and filter the information that patients bring to them whilst fully respecting the empowerment that it, it gives to patients. There's also an increasing awareness of complementary therapies, also facilitated by the web and new media, which doctors need to be aware of. And of course, there's a rapid accrual and dissemination of the latest evidence in conventional healthcare, which is changing not every five years, which is what the textbook publication cycle used to be when I was a medical student, but it's now changing you know, every month or every week in terms of how new evidence comes out that, that changes our practice. And then, of course, increasing prominence of non-medical healthcare providers. So nurses, physiotherapists, and, and the whole team, all of this has drastically changed the role of the physician uh, in the last years. And that role has changed from a dispenser of privileged information and instructions, which is what the physician used to be, to now an expert in applying objective knowledge from population-based studies to individual patients and their unique circumstances. And that's quite a challenge, because the physician has to take you know, data, information about new drugs, new, new interventions that come out from studies of 10,000 patients, but then apply it to the individual patient in their uh, clinic at the time. So this makes the physician really more of a navigator, a guide, and a co-pilot. And here I'm going to take a one-minute detour to mention cultural differences in how physicians are taking on the, this new role and my experience as a, as a British practicing physician who's worked in uh, other countries including Switzerland um, and have many collaborators, colleagues in the US and Germany. What I've noted interestingly, and this is an international audience so I'd like to put it out there, <clears throat> is that whereas in the US and in German speaking countries I've noticed that uh, physicians have taken generally very well to this role. It's obviously a generalization, there are always exceptions but they've taken well to this role and they engage with patients uh, almost as the patient's ally. 
And the pity is that in the UK, my experience from what I've observed is that despite a lot of um, good words about uh, you know, opening up to, to patients and taking on board their views, actually in practice, the physician tends still to talk down to, to the patient. There's a certain condescension inherent in the doctor-patient relationship that seems to be pretty specific to the UK. At least it's not there in German-speaking countries or the US. Happy to discuss that uh, at the end, uh, including obviously with British members of the audience and, and their own experience. Um, but, but I say that as a self-criticism in a way because I'm a British-trained physician. Pertinent to this seminar and to the really excellent blurb that's written uh, at, just above the, the, the program that we have, there's a few paragraphs of excellent text there summarizing what this is about. You saw what I said about how which the, the role of the doctor changes from this to this with the new media. Well, actually, the definition of leaders or the, the challenges that leaders face, as it says on, on your program at the top, I'm going to read it out to you because it's very similar to the challenges that physicians face as we move forward. Leaders have to weigh up an ever wider range of risks and diverse probabilities and engage more stakeholders than ever before. That's exactly what physicians are doing today in the doctor-patient relationship. Evidence-based analysis has never mattered more, yet demands on decision-making are articulated in ever simpler terms. So that's really uh, pretty much exactly what we're having to do as physicians. So this one-way dialogue from dispensing treatment and advice is now changing to a two-way dialogue to help patients make the most informed and personally tailored choices for themselves and for their unique circumstances. And um, I'd like to pay tribute here to two individuals, uh, both Americans, which is not surprising considering what I said earlier. One of them is known to one of the members of the audience here, and he's Bernie Siegel at Yale University Medical School, who really has done more to help cancer patients empower themselves than just about anyone. And the other is Al Mully, who's a mutual friend of John and I's, who founded the Informed, whoops, the Informed Decision Making Foundation, Informed Medical Decision Making Foundation. And he was at Harvard for 30 years and has just moved to Dartmouth. And this really is what the holy grail of modern medicine is about, which is personalized medicine. You know, we think about personalized medicine in terms of understanding the entire genetic makeup of an individual, but it's also about just understanding that individual and their choices, helping them to make the right choices for themselves. So that was patient education. What about the impact of new media on disease burden and therapy through lifestyle changes? As you probably know, the huge and growing burden of, non, of chronic non-communicable diseases comprises these diseases here. And these are the biggest global health challenges we face over the next 50 years. And many of these conditions will be familiar to you. They interact with each other, so obesity predisposing to all this plethora of conditions. And type 2 diabetes that itself is uh, in, uh, promoted by, by obesity and interacts with all of these. So you can... And actually, when you look at the root cause of these major killer diseases, you see they lie in physical inactivity, in unhealthy habits, and unhealthy diets. And actually, the triad, uh, the, cause, the causation triad, uh, arises from these three areas. Our genes, our diet, and our lifestyle. Why our genes? Well, our genes, because our genes have been adapting to our environment over a period of many millennia. But in the last, literally, <laughs> in, 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 in literally the last 50 to 100 years, our environments and our lifestyles have changed more dramatically than they have over the previous 20,000 years in just the space of three or four generations. So our genes have not had time to adapt to our new lifestyle, which is one of a high a calorie rich, uh, salt rich, and fat rich diet. Uh, and a, uh, a lifestyle of decreased activity, decreased physical activity. And so one thing that's a self-evident truth is that we can't change our genes, but we can change what we eat and we can change what we do. So we can actually address this, this, this issue through improving our diets, improving exercise, and cutting out bad habits, improving our lifestyle. But to do this, the three key tools that are all part of modern medicine and have only really been talked about in the last few years are shared decision-making, self-care, and behavioral change. And that's a big challenge because changing human behavior 
is perhaps the biggest single challenge to global health in the next 50 years because most of these diseases are caused by our behaviors which need to readapt to our environments considering our genes adapt much much more slowly and so my last slide is really about this and it's summarizing the impact of new media on this huge issue of non-communicable disease and what what is causing it so the new media these are the positive effects I think it can have. It can indicate to people the urgent need for lifestyle change and it can help them to mediate that change by, it can help them to affect and support lifestyle change through using new media in intelligent ways. But the danger is the increased time we spent in front of screens is time not doing other things, which includes decreased physical activity and decreased real life interpersonal interaction, which is I think a serious and growing issue for young children, and also its impact on cognitive function. There's one positive impact investigated by my colleague and former teacher, uh, Baroness Professor Susan Greenfield from Oxford, which is increased speed of information processing, but I think that is outweighed by the decreased attention span and the loss of real life, real life interpersonal interaction that children are getting, and this in turn is contributing to the epidemic of childhood obesity. So I'd just like to leave you there with all the possible benefits and disadvantages of the new media and uh, hand over now to uh, uh, Bright Simon. Thank you.